You're listening to an Ono Media podcast. Good morning, and thanks for joining me for Rise and Crime, your morning caffeine hit all about crime. I'm Mama Jules. And you know how you see some couples and you think those two should not be together? Well, that's our first story, and this relationship is clearly toxic. Back in April of 2022, 28-year-old Christian Ambuselli and 26-year-old Courtney Clenny were a passionate couple that was making a habit of familiarizing themselves with the Miami-Dade police. Over several weeks, the police had been called to the high-rise apartment the two shared nine different times. So who are these two? Well, Courtney Clenny is the daughter of Deborah and Kim Clenny. She grew up in Texas, but her desire or her quest for fame led Courtney to leave Texas at the age of 18 and head west to Los Angeles. And it seems Courtney used what was gifted to her. She's what a lot of people would think. She's beautiful. She's fit. And it seems she's uninhibited. And if you're going to make it big in the fitness videos and the bikini contests, then you got to be inhibited. It's kind of a must. But that name that was gifted to her, well, she actually changed that to Courtney Tyler. Initially, she utilized Instagram and YouTube for her success, but she soon expanded that digital footprint. She secured some small roles in productions like Boyhood and Everybody Wants Some. But those gigs, the social media fame and the small acting roles, they weren't paying the bills. So... She worked for a short time as an exotic dancer before she dove into the murky world of OnlyFans. And that's when she hit her jackpot. She quickly found financial security and a form of pseudo fame. In 2020, Courtney met Christian, who was working in his own murky world as a cryptocurrency trader. Christian also goes by the name Toby, but I'm going to refer to him as Christian throughout the story. At about the same time of meeting Christian, That's when Courtney was finding big success in social media. And as her platform grew, she eventually reached 2 million followers on Instagram and she expanded those followers to other platforms. And Christian was kind of a mainstay. He was seen with her on photo shoots and from the outside looking in, Christian appeared to be taking a managerial role in Courtney's business endeavors. Well, the fame and the relationship led to them traveling the globe. And at one point in their relationship, Courtney and Christian were living in a penthouse apartment in Austin, Texas. Courtney had returned to her roots. But the Instagram relationship that seemed near perfect was instead dark and contentious behind closed doors. Neighbors at the penthouse reported loud and verbally aggressive arguments between the two. And those arguments occurred often and they could be heard through the surrounding walls. And another OnlyFans model who worked on a collab with Courtney, well, she said that Courtney was just not doing that well. She said she seemed unstable, and in their short time together, she felt like Courtney was relying heavily on alcohol and drugs just to cope throughout the day. And that same model said when the usage of drugs and alcohol increased, then the ugly verbal arguments between Christian and Courtney, well, they increased as well. Now, just months after they began dating, Christian and Courtney, well, they were in Las Vegas when another altercation in their hotel room led to Courtney calling the police asking for them to remove Christian from her room. When officers arrived and took statements, they learned that Courtney had hurled a drinking glass in Christian's direction. Okay, that's against the law. And Courtney was the one arrested in that situation. She was the one charged with domestic battery, but that charge was later dropped. In a search for a fresh start, the two decide to relocate to Miami, making their new home in a luxury high-rise condo. And it might have been a new neighborhood with new surroundings, but the same old aggressive behavior set up residents in that condo. Quickly, neighbors were complaining to building owners that the two would argue loudly and frequently. And it wasn't just their direct neighbors. Apartment dwellers two floors above the couple complained about the arguments. Now, two of the times that Miami-Dade police were called to the condo to intervene in the disputes Well, those two times happened on the very day they moved in. 
And all of this led to the deadly afternoon of April 3rd, 2022, and Courtney placing a call to 911. Here, why don't you give that first minute of that call a listen? Ma'am, listen to me. You need to stop screaming on the line and give me the address. 3101. I can't feel my arm. 3101. I can't feel my arm. Ma'am, my boyfriend is dying of a stab. Ma'am, what is the address? What's the address? 3131. 3131, North 3, North 7 Please, God, please. Come see my boyfriend. I'm going to Ma'am, is this a house department or a business? One two seven four five three five eight two. Is this a house apartment or a business? Baby, I'm so sorry. Baby. Ma'am, can you hear me? All right. Now, in that call, you can hear what might be some of Christian's last words that he ever spoke. He says several times that he's going to die and that he can't feel his arm. And Courtney, well, she's obviously frantic, she tells the 911 operator that her boyfriend is going to die. She then apologizes to Christian and she says, baby, I'm sorry. All right, so what even led up to this 911 call and this apparent death? Well, court documents say that Courtney stabbed Christian in the chest with a kitchen knife on that Sunday afternoon. Now the knife wound punctured Christian's chest about three inches deep and came at a downward angle. Courtney claims it was self-defense based upon months and months of abuse. Well, prosecutors saw it differently. They say the attack was unprovoked and not an accident. Body cam footage has been released of the first moments when police entered the apartment. And you guys, this apartment is complete chaos. I'm going to play that body cam footage for you. Um, just give it a listen. It is a little difficult to listen to, but give it a listen. Now you have to listen past the barking dogs who are frantic about the uncontrolled situation. And Courtney, she's got blood all over her face and her chest, and she is begging Christian to wake up. She also does not follow the commands that officers are giving her, which I believe makes the whole thing even more chaotic. Now you guys, this whole thing, first off, Christian is not responsive. And I'm getting all anxious that it has taken so long for him to get emergency care. And secondly, this apartment is a wreck. The EMTs and police are going to have a difficult time even navigating the area. I've always felt that, I mean, this is just my like raising of kids. I've always told them, if you live in a chaotic house, then you probably have a chaotic mental state. Because when you're around that much chaos, your mental status is going to align with the chaos. If you're in a more structured home, your mental status is going to align with that structured, you know, state of affairs. And it's not absolute. It doesn't ring true all the time, but it does ring true more often than not. And this apartment to me 
represents a couple that were living in complete chaos. There's boxes and clothes and things just stuffed in corners. It is not a thriving living situation. Now, after Christian is tended to, after the EMTs get there, they determine he died from the stab wound that sliced a key artery near Christian's heart. And there's more police cam video. When Courtney is on the floor of the hallway of the apartment building, while police are doing the initial portions of the investigation, and also while Christian's body is being removed from the apartment, she keeps reassuring the dogs that daddy is coming back. Now, I don't know if she's in a state of denial or if she's playing it up for the cops, but watching the videos that have been released, I can say that a clear-minded person would realize Christian is not going to make it. And I think we understand she's not clear-minded right then, though, so maybe I can't expect this of her. As she's answering questions from authorities, Courtney states that she threw the knife at Christian and she said she was approximately 10 feet away when she did so. Well, police let Courtney go after that questioning and they begin their investigation. And Courtney gathered up her stuff and she ran. Almost immediately, she returned to Texas where she purchased a $1.35 million home that was just down the street from her parents, Kim and Deborah. She didn't stay there long though. After a few months, Courtney was eventually arrested for the murder of Christian and she was charged with second degree homicide. She was in Hawaii undergoing rehab at the time of her arrest, but she didn't fight extradition back to Florida. All right, so follow that timeline. The murder happens in Florida. She leaves pretty quickly, within days, to Texas to get closer to her parents. She buys a $1.35 million home. Then she ends up in rehab in Hawaii, and that's where they arrest her. Well, as the investigation was developing, more police body cam footage came into discovery. Okay, police had been at the high-rise apartment just two days before the murder. If you remember, I told you, they visited that place nine times in just the few weeks that the two lived there. Now, this one that happened two days before the murder, this obviously was a domestic violence call. And in the recorded police cam footage, remember from two days before the murder, Courtney's crying and she's visibly shaken. And during that call, police interviewed a security guard employed by the high rise. And he told cops that Courtney was in the lobby area and that Christian came charging towards her. He said when Courtney retreated that Christian tried to follow her into the elevator. Now, during the dispute, Courtney was allegedly telling Christian she did not want him in the elevator with her or near her in any other way. She also told responding officers that she wanted a restraining order against Christian because he was stalking her. Now, when this body cam footage was released, Courtney's lawyer told reporters that he had possession of photographs that show the abuses that Courtney suffered. He also said that Courtney was in a struggle for her life and that she had to defend herself. And he said, unfortunately, that defense ended Christian's life. Now, the prosecution has asserted that a thrown knife could not enter Christian's chest at the abrupt downward angle that the autopsy established. And prosecutors also say, Courtney, she's just not strong enough to throw a knife and have it enter a human body three inches deep. Now, all of this back and forth of releasing evidence and then releasing autopsy reports, well, it brought out more security camera footage. This time, it was from several weeks before Christian's death, and that footage was caught in the high-rise elevator. In that camera footage, it appears that Courtney's the aggressor. She is seen slamming the elevator's control panel before hitting Christian. Now, the blows continue to be thrown by Courtney, and for many of them, it seems Christian was kind of just ducking or deflecting them, and he's just kind of trying to get out of the way. But finally, he pushes her back away from him, and when the doors open and the two exit, Christian leaves first, and Courtney follows him, slapping and hitting him from behind. And we now have even more evidence that doesn't look so great for Courtney. Prosecutors are contending that on the day of the murder, that Courtney called Christian at 4.01 in the afternoon. After hanging up with him, she went live on Instagram for just a short time. She then called Christian again at 4.33 
And it seems Christian was in the building because he enters the apartment right after that phone call. Now, the dispute happened pretty quickly. And the prosecution is saying that Courtney stabs Christian shortly after he enters the apartment. Courtney doesn't call 911 right away, though. First, she calls her mom at 443. Now they talk for six minutes. Then she hangs up and she calls her mom right back, almost instantly. The second call to her mom lasted nearly seven minutes. She then hangs up with her mother and calls 911. Now, if all of this checks out at trial, the timeline would indicate that Courtney left Christian wounded on the floor of the chaotic apartment for a minimum of 15 minutes and a potential maximum of 24 minutes. Now, it takes EMTs another eight minutes to enter the apartment. That's a long time on the floor unattended with a wound to an artery near the heart. Now, with all these revelations by the state, Courtney's attorneys are not happy. They released a statement condemning the state for trying the case in the court of public opinion. And guess what happened? (laughs) More evidence was leaked. The state also claims this was not the first time that Courtney stabbed Christian. They say they have evidence that Courtney stabbed Christian in the leg and that she also called him the N-word during their fights. And the prosecutors are saying they have evidence that she has threatened to kill him before he actually died on that April afternoon. Now, while all of this back and forth is going on, Courtney has been incarcerated in Miami awaiting trial. And the whole case? Well, it got messier. It happened when Deborah and Kim Clenny, that's her parents, well, they were each charged with one count of unauthorized access of a computer or electronic device. So here's what happened there. In the days following the murder, it is alleged that Courtney gave her parents Christian's laptop. Then Courtney and her parents exchanged text messages where they were sleuthing, trying to figure out what was the password to that laptop computer. Well, in Florida, this is against the law. The laptop is his property, and they should not have been accessing it after his death. Well, Courtney was charged with the same count, but those charges... They only lasted a few months because this week they were dropped due to attorney-client privilege. Right, here's how that played out. Courtney and her parents have the same attorney and the state read text messages and submitted those texts as evidence even though those texts were between his clients and him. So between Courtney, Courtney's parents, and the defense attorney. Now due to the attorney-client privilege, the charges were dropped. Even though the texts seemed nefarious in nature, that the three were trying to dig up dirt on Christian and that they were also purposely withholding his property from his immediate family members. All right, the parents, they're off the hook. And Courtney, she's still facing second degree murder charges. There is no trial date that's been set for Courtney. The state and her attorneys just keep hashing out motions in this complicated case. Let me know what you think. It is not always the male that is the aggressor in a relationship, and it could actually be both of them. Maybe both are to blame here. Also, this is just the tip of the iceberg in this case. So much more info will be shared at trial and could be shared here, but time is limited. So I'll keep you updated when it is decided that Courtney will see the inside of a courtroom with 12 jurors weighing in on her fate. And there is another high profile case that I haven't been covering, but today seems like a good time to catch you all up. It's the Young Thug Rico trial. Okay, this trial started back in November of 2023. That was after a months long jury selection process. So it took forever to get the jurors. And then the actual trial started in November of 2023. And you guys, I kid you not, it is the longest criminal trial in all of Georgia's history. And Young Thug is his stage name. His given name, Jeffrey Lamar Williams. The Fulton County District Attorney in Georgia has alleged that the Grammy winner is a co-founder of a violent criminal street gang and that Young Thug used his music to promote his street gang. Okay, this has me a little baffled because isn't that just what rap music or a lot of it is about? It's weird that Young Thug is being targeted, but he is, so let's dive in. They brought charges against him in May of 2022, 
and they denied his bond in June of 2022. That means many, many days have been spent behind bars for Young Thug, whose artist label, Young Stoner Life Records, has been alleged to have deep ties to the Atlanta gang named Young Slime Life. Yes, all of these names are confusing. I hope you're following me. So it's Young Thug, he has his artist label, and then he has the street gang, Young Slime Life. And... I'm saying he has the street gang. He might not. That's what he's contending. He says he doesn't have them. So let's start from the beginning. Young Thug is known for and has become famous by kind of rapping in a mumble-like delivery. He's had three number one albums on the Billboard 200 chart. That was 2019's album titled So Much Fun, 2021's Punk, and then the 2021 compilation album titled Young Stoner Life slime language too. Can you see the connections here? Remember the gang has the word slime in it. There's a lot of connections between the gang and what Young Thug is doing, even though he says he has nothing to do with it. Now he's worked with big, big names like Drake and Travis Scott, and he's even had crossover hits with Camila Cabello and Childish Gambino. Well, after working under the Gucci main label, Young Thug launched YSL Records, which stands for Young Stoner Life. And apparently, I mean, I have nothing to do with this, but he is quite the fashion icon. I learned that he tends to wear gender-defying outfits and that he even dressed in a dress for the cover of his 2016 mixtape titled Jeffrey. So it sounds like he makes a lot of music and money, but the Fulton County DA doesn't like his gang activity. Back in May of 2022, Young Thug was charged with racketeering, also charged with selling drugs and violations in the weapons that he owns. And it wasn't just him, though. It wasn't just Young Thug getting arrested. 27 other people were included in the racketeering portion of the charges. Three months later, the DA handed down more charges of RICO. In total, Young Thug is charged with eight of the total 65 charges that the entire group was nailed with. Now, it seems the most serious charge is the connection to the death of Donovan Thomas Jr. Okay, Donovan is a rival gang member who was killed in 2015 in a drive-by shooting incident. Prosecutors believe that Young Thug rented the 2014 Infiniti Q50 sedan that the killers used to complete that drive-by murder. Now, of course, Young Thug pleaded not guilty to the eight charges and says he has nothing to do with any of them. His lawyers say it is a stretch to tie his record label to any gang activity. Now, those lawyers also say that of those 65 charges, some of them are legitimate, but they say none of the eight charges filed against Young Thug have merit. Now, the charges do say that there were a total of 181 acts of crime that occurred between 2013 and 2022. Some of those acts include social media posts and rap songs that mention the gang and their violent activities. Now, some of those other defendants, they took plea deals. That includes young thug's brother, Quantavius Greer. He pled guilty in December of 2022, and in exchange for his testimony, he was not required to serve any jail time. But he went and screwed that all up. Quantavius was pulled over for an alleged window tint violation. Again, we could get in a whole argument about cops pulling people over with window tint violations, but that's why he was pulled over. And during that traffic stop, he was found to be carrying a nine millimeter handgun. Well, that violated his terms of probation. Quantavius is now serving a nine and a half year prison sentence. He has claimed that he did not rat out his brother though. And some really weird things have happened in this long trial. First off, Judge Glanville made a controversial decision early on that the lyrics of Young Thug's music could be used as evidence against him. Then Judge Glanville allegedly held a meeting with a key witness and the terms of that meeting did not follow the strict rules of the courtroom. That started a string of motions where defense attorneys asked that Judge Glanville be removed from the case. Now, along with the requested removal, 
Young Thug's attorney was thrown in jail (laughs) on a contempt charge because that attorney would not reveal how he found out about the illegal meeting with the key witness. Well, just this week, that request for a new judge, it was finally granted. So for now, the trial is halted and a new judge will be placed on the case. That timeline of the placement of the new judge, it's not yet to be determined. But let's get back to that decision by Judge Glanville to allow the lyrics to be used as evidence. Judge Glanville said 17 specific sets of lyrics could be used as evidence as long as they have direct ties to the crimes that young thug is accused of committing. Well, those lyrics from songs like Just How It Is and Mob Ties, well, they reference the YSL gang, Young Slime Life, remember? YSL gang. Well, according to People Magazine, last year, California Governor Gavin Newsom signed a bill into law that restricts the use of lyrics as evidence in criminal trials. And more than 100 artists and music industry leaders wrote an open letter saying the practice criminalizes black talent. Now, in that open letter titled, Art on Trial, Protect Black Art, Those artists cited Young Thug's incarceration, and they wrote that using his lyrics in legal proceedings is, quote, an overt act in furtherance of the conspiracy. Now, despite strong legal opposition from the defense and public activism in the Protect Black Art movement, the judge ruled in early November that at least 17 specific sets of lines from the music of Young Thug and other YSL artists could be used by the state to argue for the existence of the gang. Now, the defendant's membership in the alleged criminal conspiracy, that could also be brought up, as well as their state of mind regarding specific crimes they are accused of committing. Meaning, if they're writing about it, they might be potentially committing the crimes. I feel like it's a stretch, but I can also get where they're coming from. Well, during the trial, lyrics were used a four and a half minute song titled Lifestyle that includes the supergroup, that's Young Thug and Rich Home Kwan. Well, that four and a half minutes, they were played in court in January. But in a crazy twist, it wasn't the state that played the lyrics. It was Young Thug's lawyer. He played the lyrics because he felt like the accompanying music video explained the lyrics meaning And then it would be understood that the song isn't referencing any specific gang. Well, it didn't work. Judge Glanville allowed the lyrics, but not the music video. And that didn't really establish what the defense attorney was hoping. He wanted the court to understand that Tick Stevens, okay, that's a YSL co-founder who took a plea deal in 2022 because he was part of the group that had the 65 charges filed against them, Well, Young Thug's attorney was hoping to show that Tick Stevens' testimony was just not accurate. See, Tick was saying that Young Thug was an integral part of Young Slime Life. And the defense attorney said the music video would show that he isn't an integral part. You guys, it's no wonder this trial has taken so long. But I need to tell you about one more delay. Right after the trial started in December of last year, One of Young Thug's five co-defendants was stabbed in jail. 31-year-old Shannon Stilwell got in a fight with another inmate and was stabbed multiple times. Now, he did make a full recovery, but the incarceration of these men is no joke. Stilwell was stabbed by a guy who was charged with felony murder, felony cruelty to children, and aggravated assault. And the reason for the fight? It's not been disclosed. But the attacking prisoner had charges of assault added to his long list of misdeeds, as well as possession of dangerous paraphernalia, meaning he probably attacked this guy with like a shank or something that he had made, and that was the dangerous paraphernalia. All right, so where does that leave us? For now, the jury of nine women and three men are just hanging tight. They have no idea when they will return to the courtroom, and this is not new for them. They've been in this courtroom on and off since November. You guys, it's so long for a RICO trial. And the replacement of Judge Glanville, well, it might just take a minute. Because Judge Glanville and the judge that forced Judge Glanville's recusal have some interesting ties. One has donated to the other judge's re-election campaign, 
And young Thug's attorney feels like this complicates the whole case. Now, he filed a 200-page motion about this complication, and that motion hasn't even been ruled on yet. So that will delay the appointment of another judge even further. So we're just going to have to wait and see what happens and if young Thug is found guilty. If he is found guilty, he could serve up to 120 years in prison. And let's finish with this story out of Arizona, where a father let video games take importance over his daughter's life. 37-year-old Christopher Schultes left his two-year-old daughter, Parker, sleeping inside his 2023 Acura MDX. This happened after the father of three had returned home from shopping on July 9th, so just a few days ago. Now, you're probably asking, why leave her in the car? Well, he didn't want to wake her. At least that's what he told cops. All right, you guys, I have two kids and their spouses and my only grandchild living in Arizona right now. The heat over the past two weeks has been unrelenting and suffocating, and they have air conditioning. This two-year-old was in the parked car alone, but it wasn't Christopher who popped back outside to check on his daughter. No, it was his anesthesiologist wife who returned to their home from work to find her little Parker dead inside the car. When Christopher was asked how long it had been since he had left Parker outside, he lied or he misremembered. And what he told authorities is that he had been about 30 minutes since he left Parker out there. But when investigators checked his online gaming history, they discovered he had been playing for more than three hours. When Christopher was caught in that lie or that misremembering of 30 minutes playing video games, he changed his story and told investigators he had returned home to their Tucson suburb home in Marana, and that that time frame was about 2.30. He said he parked the car outside instead of parking it in the garage because the garage had some exercise equipment stacked up inside. He then said he forgot that Parker was in the car and that his wife discovered her dead at four o'clock when she couldn't find the child inside the home. Now, he changed his story from 30 minutes to an hour and a half, but neither of those stories seems true because surveillance footage shows that Christopher arrived outside of his house at 1230 that day, not 230. And he left Parker in the car with temps hovering at 110 degrees. His wife discovered the child over three hours later. According to Christopher's statement to police, he finally admitted that he became distracted putting the groceries away and then he began playing video games. When Parker's older siblings were interviewed, they told investigators that their father regularly left kids in the car if they fell asleep. Now, Christopher also said he tried to do the correct thing by leaving the car running with the air conditioning on, but he also knew the car would automatically shut off after 30 minutes. Well, following the death of their daughter, Christopher's wife sent him text messages that said, how many times have I told you? I told you to stop leaving them in the car. Christopher had responded to those text messages by writing, babe, I'm sorry, Babe, our family, how could I do this? I killed our baby. This can't be real. Now, when Christopher was arraigned in court last Friday on charges of second-degree murder and child endangerment, his wife pleaded with the judge to release him pending his trial. She called the fatal decision, quote, a big mistake. She told the judge that she wanted her husband to return home so that they could begin the grieving process as a family and also so they could bury their daughter. The judge set his bail at $25,000, despite the prosecutor requesting a $1 million bond. His preliminary hearing is set for August 1st. Well, that's your Thursday episode of Rise and Crime. And I know I say it all the time, but I really appreciate you being a part of the Rise and Crime family. Please share this content with a friend so we can grow our family even bigger. I also love five-star reviews, positive comments, whether you're on YouTube or Instagram or on whatever streaming platform where you're listening. Those are great as well. You can join me again on Monday for more morning crime news. I'm Mama Jules and keep safe out there.